being such an important part of the Torres Strait Islander culture, multi-award winning composer Anthony Partos conducted extensive research into authentic music from the area and the era. Travelling to the Torres Strait and Murray Island specifically, he worked with local musicians and singers in the creation of the soundtrack that accompanies the film. Partos utilises instruments indigenous to the Torres Strait, including the large drum known as the warp, as well as voices and strings. Wanting to be true to the sounds of the island, Partos decided not to do a studio recording and instead recorded the songs in situ, which means locally or on site, on set during the filming. One such song was that performed during the opening sequence of the film, where Jimmy Banny as the young Eddie participates in a traditional dance during the ill-fated communal celebration. A song which is later heard during the haunting moments of his abject homesickness later in the film. In this scene, the tribal verses come into play as Eddie is in the James Cook University Library in Townsville examining books written mostly by white scholars about Aboriginal culture and history. The extreme close-up on Eddie's face exemplifies the intensity with which he is studying these resources and the strong emotions they evoke as they trigger memories of the stories and teachings passed on to him by Benny Marbo. Oh, that's Eddie. He's the gardener. That's his favourite spot. Noel Luz is watching from behind a bookshelf. In 2016, Noel Luz is a professor teaching the history of black-white relations in Australia at James Cook University in Townsville. He has conducted close research into Aboriginal mission history, frontier conflict, the place of Aborigines in colonial society and the evolution of government policies for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people. In the 1970s, he pioneered the development of teacher education programs in Queensland for Aboriginal and Islander people. When Noel met Eddie, he was a lecturer at James Cook University on Aboriginal history and anthropology. He remained a friend of Eddie Marbo for 25 years and helped write the book entitled Edward Koiki Marbo, His Life and Struggle for Land Rights, which was published in 1996. The way Noel observes Eddie from a distance in this scene illustrates not only the social distance between black and white during this era, but also the tendency for white scholars to make observations and assumptions about Indigenous people without directly consulting the sources. Noel's hesitance approaching Eddie, despite his familiarity with Aboriginal history, might suggest that his liaisons with the Indigenous community might be limited to books as opposed to first-hand experience. The discussion they will soon have in the garden will illustrate how such limited understanding can create misconceptions and misinformation. The librarian seems quite fond of Eddie, saying that's his favourite spot, which might illustrate some shifting attitudes towards the Aborigines. Hello there. Good day. Have I seen you in the library? You may have. There's no law against that, is there? Just unusual to see a gardener in the library. You mean it's unusual to see a black fella in the library? Uh, no. Uh, let, let's start again. Uh, I, I teach Aboriginal history and anthropology. I, I just saw you reading like a man transfixed and I wonder what you're looking at. A bloke called Haddon. The Cambridge Expedition, 1898. What'd you make of it? He's got bits of it, right? Most of it's rubbish. Something we both agree on? We do. No loose. Eddie Mabo. In the first exchange between Noel and Eddie, Noel is seen uncomfortably and nervously shifting in his stance, while Eddie gives short, abrupt and defensive answers, such as, there's no law against that, is there? Eddie is so used to being discriminated against that he preemptively expects white people to approach him in this way, asking for trouble instead of for the purposes of a mutual liaison. However, Eddie's raised eyebrows when he says, we do, shows his surprise that a white scholar would acknowledge shortcomings in the text of a white explorer, in this case, Haddon. 
Knowles' shared knowledge of Aboriginal history and his ability to think critically in this way opens Eddie up to him. Eddie Marbo, Henry Reynolds. Uh, Henry writes a lot about Aboriginal history. So you have an interest in Indigenous issues? <laughs> Where do you want to start? I mean, the Indigenous Housing Co-op, I'm the chairman. The Black Community School, I'm the headmaster. Hell of a job getting that going, I tell you. In his lifetime, Henry Reynolds' primary work has been as a historian, focusing on the frontier conflict between European settlers in Australia and Indigenous Australians. Reynolds looked into the issue of Indigenous land ownership in international law and encouraged Marbo to take the matter to court. It was there, over the sandwiches and tea, that the first step was taken which led to the Marbo judgment in June 1992. Marbo then talked to lawyers and Reynolds had little to do with the case itself from that time, although he and Marbo remained friends until the latter's death in January 1992. It's not an easy path, Eddie, the road of the activist. Never has been, but in a climate like this with Joe in government, it's even worse. The special branch have got files on everyone who ever attended a demonstration in this state. They'll know every move you make and who you make it with, and they will find a way to silence you. We spoke in episode 10 about the special branch keeping files on everyone. When they talk about Joe being in government, they're referring to the then Premier of Queensland, Joe Bielke peterson he was the longest serving Premier of Queensland and held office from 1968 to 1987. Joe actually became Sir Bjorki Peterson as he was knighted in 1984 in recognition of being a strong believer in historic tradition of parliamentary democracy. His leadership led to great economic growth in Queensland. However, it was later revealed that the government he led was institutionally corrupt. The Premier was subject to a lot of controversy due to the way money was handled, discrimination and the way the police force was run. Bjorki Peterson was a divisive Premier and earned himself a reputation as a law and order politician with his repeated use of police force against street demonstrators and strong-arm tactics with trade unions, leading to frequent descriptions of Queensland under his leadership as a police state. Despite a great deal of evidence bringing light to Joe's mishandling of his power, he was and still is revered as a great and popular politician in Queensland to this day. What more can they do to me that hasn't already been done? I've lost jobs. I've been in the stinking lockup. What more can they do? Eddie is again smoking in this scene, suggesting that he is contemplating his next move. Eddie seems very confident when he says, what more can they do to me that hasn't already been done? I've lost jobs, I've been in the stinking lockup. what more can they do? However, in the background, Benita can be seen behind a door. This is the filmmaker highlighting how Eddie often tends to focus on the cost to himself and neglect the cost to his family, who are put at considerable risk due to his political endeavours.